Hello, I'm Chuck Martin, and welcome to the Voices of the Internet of Things. With me today is Sean Borman, President and CEO of Air Auto. Sean has been CEO of the Rugby Academy of America, Executive Director of Global Restorative Care, and founder of Monster Sports Network. At Air Auto, Sean is focused on creating and growing a fully integrated showroom dealership specializing in air vehicle transportation, including complete sales and service of air vehicles. Welcome here, Sean. Good to see you. Thank you, Chuck. I, I appreciate this opportunity. So tell me about Air Auto. How did you ever get this idea? Aero Auto was born out of the idea of trying to find my second career. I was uh, uh, doing some uh, searching and, and saw that the, uh, the the industry was coming through Facebook and through Instagram and a few articles here and there that um, just showed that flying cars were well on the way. And I've always tried to get into an industry at the at the ground level, and I keep missing it for one reason or another. And I uh, saw that it was coming, and I had uh, dinner with my uh, partner, my co-founder, one night, and I said, you know, uh, flying cars are coming. We should do something like invent a parts or an accessory or get into racing or something. And he suggested doing a dealership, which was just so far outside of my scope of thinking at that point. And uh, afterwards, I, I went home and started doing a whole lot of uh, research and realized that there was no other companies globally that were in the sales and service end of it, except for the manufacturers that were trying to do a, a Tesla model on, on, on their own, which is just, you know, trying to sell it and and, and create it at the same time. And it, it's just a, a business model that that's really hard to pull off unless you're, you know, Elon Musk. So how do you, so, how did you, you were early. Yeah. This is a couple uh, of years ago. That was really early. Yeah. July was our uh, two year anniversary. But the industry is just starting to explode now, <laughs> two years later. Yeah, so we wanted to be the first in. Uh, we've been working really hard to uh, land the manufacturers uh, that are ready. And as they are as they show that they're ready or are starting to take reservations or make sales, uh, we are, are, are trying to jump on them and to um, get them in, into our portfolio. Yeah, I saw you just did a, a deal with a, a company in Perth, Australia, Ace VTOL, uh, right? Yeah, Brett's fantastic. He's got an amazing vehicle uh, that's a hydrogen uh, plasma ion powered. So he, he's really ahead of the curve as far as the technology goes. And we're real excited to see all the different uh, vehicles he comes up with. Uh, every time I turn around, he's sending me a new version or a new uh, a new vehicle that he wants to do later on, you know, phase three, phase four. And and he he's so far above and beyond all the other designers out there right now, as far as uh, the creativity goes. So how do you find all these manufacturers? Because they're, they're everywhere research. now. Research. And, you know, the, the companies are are advertising themselves, which helps us out a lot. You know, they, they start putting out into social media and into the different rags, you know, that they're ready to start taking orders or, or taking reservations or making sales. And, you know, we're just scooping them up one by one as, the, as they say that. So what, hap- what, what do you see as the dealer of the future? If someone walks into a showroom and there are different flying vehicles there? That's our business model. Um, the whole point and purpose of, of what we're doing is customer education. And by, by doing that, uh, a customer comes in and has no knowledge or expectations or past experience of what any of these EV tolls and flying machines can do other than the, the current helicopters and planes that are, that are out there. And so there's no, no brand recognition. There's no option knowledge. There's no idea of, of what they can get or what they can't get, what the price range is, uh, you know, and what their use cases are and could be. So they come into us and they say, you know, I've got a budget of this and this is my use case. And we then direct them to the appropriate vehicles for what they need. The biggest problem right now is that all these vehicles are being distributed and, and created around the world. And if there's no way to test drive these for one thing and to actually see one up close, you've got to go to California, then you got to go to Japan and you got to go to Germany and then you got to go to Florida. And then you, it just doesn't make any sense. So we're trying to put uh, as many dealers and manufacturers into one place at a time to give the customer a real crew opportunity to see, touch, feel, experience these vehicles firsthand because they don't even believe that they're real. So yeah, we, whether we hear a, that. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, so whether it's, you know, just a, a customer off the street or a municipality or a government agency, you know, they, they can't even wrap their heads around the fact that these things are coming. So how many, how many of these things would be in a dealership, would you think, typically? We are honestly trying to get as many in as we can. You know, we, we, we're not prognosticators, so we're not sure who's actually going to make it fall all the way through. You know, it, it takes a tremendous amount of money to go from concept to production. Uh, not all of them are going to pass their certifications. Not all of them are going to be able to find the funding. So we really don't want to put all of our eggs in one basket. You know, we're not just, uh, you know, a, a Bob Chevy dealer, you know, that, that's already got, you know, a, a well-established um, reputation. You know, these are all all brand new, try, untried, untrue. There's so many different makes, models, shapes, sizes, use cases that are are being available that, you know, we want to show the, the, the customer as many options as we can. So how many dealers do you think there might be around the country, around the U.S.? How many dealerships? Yeah. How, how many physical locations where somebody could go eventually? Oh, eventually. I have no idea. But I mean, we're the only one worldwide right now. Oh, I know. <laughs> That's why we're so, talking. <laughs> so uh, as much expansion as we can make. Uh, so so do, you, do you have one open now? Uh, we had our showroom in, in uh, Stewart at Witham Field, and uh, we, we've um, decided to move from there. It was a little bit too out of the way. Uh, we're currently um, located at North Perry Airport in Hollywood, Florida, and at um, North County Airport in um, Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. And then we just signed, I don't know if you, you had seen, that we just signed uh, a big deal to open up a, a large showroom in Texas at Greenport International Airport along with uh, Emerald, uh, Emerald Island outside of uh, Austin, Texas. Uh, we're real excited about that. We should have that huge facility open within the next two years. Wow. So where are the people going to come from? Are these going to be individuals who want a, a, a certified vehicle, a, an ultralight type vehicle? Any idea yet? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, all the above, actually, from individual ultralights, which you don't really, you don't need a license for, you need a lot of, we want to have a lot of training for you before you get into it and take it home, but um, all the way up to air cargo, large passenger, air taxi, um, municipal vehicles, police, fire, uh, air ambulance, uh, organ, organ transportation, uh, public works, uh, infrastructure uh, management uh, vehicles. Uh, the, the use cases are, are tremendous. Search and rescue are, is going to be a huge opportunity for these, you know, for the Coast Guard, for lifeguards, for forest uh, forest and mountain management and rescue. So uh, yeah, we're, we're real excited to really keep seeing all the new use cases that are invented by, um, by the end users. So it sounds like you're going to be dealing with individual consumers, but also businesses are going to be interested in this based on those applications you just mentioned. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, from air taxi companies that want to uh, get into it at the end to, like I said, air ambulance uh, companies, uh, police departments are going to uh, want these. Uh, you, you mentioned Ace. Uh, I can't wait for him to uh, uh, unleash his uh, police car on the on the world. I can't give away too many of his secrets, but uh, it's it's pretty spectacular. So, how do you pick what cars you want in, in your showrooms in the future? There are so many. Yeah, right now there's about 350 different uh, manufacturers around the world, uh, close to 800 vehicles being developed. It, it's kind of a, a back and forth between the manufacturers that want the representation that Arrowado is giving, the marketing and sales and uh, services that per, that we provide to um, the ones that are available. Like I said, we're, 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 we're kind of going after them as they come to market. You know, as I, they start I would to think, show that they're available. I would think that all want to be in your showrooms. I would think so too. But uh, some of the companies have wanted to um, maintain everything in house from um, sales and and manufacturing uh, sales and um, sorry um, maintenance. That's what I was trying to think of. That that could be uh, really flight. hard. It, it's very hard. If, if if it was a sustainable business model, Chevrolet, Ford, Toyota, Honda would all be owning their own man own dealerships instead of uh, outsourcing it to the individual uh, dealers around the world. But, but it's a really difficult, sustainable model. Yeah, I would think that if, they, if, a, if a manufacturer does that, it's going to be one geography based, not, not national or global. Correct. And they can't, they can't scale it, basically. They'll right. probably figure it out eventually. And then they'll come talking to us. <laughs>
<laughs> well, you're probably going to end up getting going to have to be picky at, at some point. Yeah, we'll have to have to say no. But um, at, at the same time, the the, the manufacturers are, are going to start going by the wayside, or uh, they'll start teaming up. Yeah. You know, so like, what do you? Uh, what Kitty are... Hawk and Whisk did um, last year. So what does the 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 uh, the sky of the future look like? <laughs> Honestly, decades and decades and decades from now, um, amazing. Um, within the next 20, 25 years, it won't look any different than if you go outside and look up today. Um, that seems to be a misunderstanding of the population of, and, and I get this all the time, oh, there's going to be tons of people running into each other in the sky and falling out of the sky. And and, and my response to them is, is, you know, there's already millions and millions of, of uh, air vehicles in existence today. And very rarely do you ever hear about something colliding in midair and the technology that's coming into the, into uh, into these vehicles today are just so much more advanced than they've ever been before. But they're pretty much low altitude, relatively. Um, the FAA has uh, been making a lot of decisions as far as the corridors that they're going to be flying in. And it looks like they're, they're going to stay in the, the helicopter and small plane uh, levels of flight. So that's that's relatively low. I mean, it's not thirty thousand feet. No, no, and, and none of these vehicles are pressurized to to go that high anyway. But you know, like I said, if you if I go outside today, I may see one or two Cessnas flying across the sky, but certainly not enough to to call it a traffic jam. So why is this a global phenomenon now? Do you think? I mean, it's, it, I mean, a lot of these companies have been around for five years, but all of a sudden, it seems like like every day there's a new announcement. Oh, you're right. That's for sure. I, I got a chance to listen to uh, um, Deroni's podcast that you had last week, and he did a fantastic job. Uh, and he had it right. You know, the, the the technology today is just finally catching up to to the desires that, and, and the requirements that are needed for, you know, a, a decent, sustainable flight. You know, electric batteries are light enough um, and quiet enough that now they can you know, get you 20 minutes or, or an hour or two hours of flight versus, you know, a, a few years ago with the battery technology, it'd give you maybe five minutes and it just wasn't, it just wasn't a, a good enough idea yet. But it's, it's going now. Uh, so do you see one country ahead of another? You must know them all. <laughs> um, who's ahead? China's way ahead. I, I would have to say China's way ahead. Um, it, it's unfortunate the, the political piece of it, but, uh, um, they've really, the, the whole Asian area has really adopted this technology significantly and allowed the development to really excel. The U.S. is catching up quickly. You know, we have so many manufacturers here and, and the resources here are, are tremendous. So, you know, companies like Joby and Archer, you know, are really making a big hit, but, you know, they just want to stay in the air taxi market and are forgetting you know, all of the other use cases that are out there that are possible with, you know, from, like I said, the personal use and, and the, the municipal and first responder uh, opportunities. So what, what do you do from here? How do you, how do you plot out a five, like five years? I mean, that's almost impossible. Uh, that's a good question. Um, we just, we just want to expand. Uh, we announced uh, about a month ago now that uh, we, we've signed on with another, uh, another strategic partner that, uh, we now have reach into over 100 uh, airports and FBOs uh, coast to coast, and we are reaching out to all those different FBOs, and we have now distribution network and, and maintenance network from east to west, north to south, and uh, it, it's really going to make Aero Auto you know, expand quickly. So if you're doing maintenance for uh, uh, 10 or 20 or 50 or 100, whatever, different number of brands, how are you gonna you're gonna have to store all their parts from them? Yeah, so we we actually want to be a specialized parts dealer along with it. So, you know, unfortunately, none of the companies are ready for that point yet. But uh, um, as soon as they do, we're, we'll start opening up, uh, you know, a whole parts department as far as um, being able to to have on hand in stock, you know, all the, all the parts and pieces necessary for you know all the maintenance. The nice part about this industry, though is the low maintenance that's required and the low number of, of parts that are required. A lot of it's just going to be, you know, plug and play. Nobody has to take apart, you know, uh, a, a gas engine anymore. It's just take out the electric motor and put in a new one and ship the old one back to the manufacturer and let them deal with it. I love that idea. <laughs> 
So are you, are you going to fly these yourself? I don't know if I should tell you the truth. Well, you're going to have all these toys. I, I kind of wish you hadn't asked this question, but uh, <laughs> the, the the truth is, I'm I'm afraid of heights. So <laughs> that's too funny. Yeah, I don't I don't fly very well. I can get into 747, but uh, don't put me in anything else. All of my partners are are, are pilots, so um, <laughs> the the big joke is somebody has to stay on the ground, uh, take pictures, and and be the cheerleader. So that that's become me. So which yeah. one, which, which ones you see taking off first, so to speak, the, the ultralights or the, or waiting for the certified versions? Um, the ultralights, I, I won't say obviously, um, the ultralights will, because they don't have to go through the FAA certifications. Um, they don't fall under the same rules and regulations of um, the requirements necessary that the FAA um, has, you know, they have um, a very specific range of speed and height and, and weight that they have to maintain. And we can start selling those today. And, you know, all the other companies that are, are going from the light sport aviation, light, light sport aviation companies to the, the larger air cargo, air taxi, multi-passenger manufacturers have to go through a, a lot more scrutiny through the FAA. The ones that are going to go through uh, Air Taxi, you know, I've got to go through a whole nother level of certification. And then the companies that want to do an autonomous only model, I haven't been able to figure out what their business model is, why they want to do that yet, because they're going to be the last ones to uh, be certified. And you know, there's got to be a lot of years of, of proof and, and trust, not just by the FAA, but by the public to have anybody even want to step into into one of those vehicles that don't have a pilot? Right. Well, the, I don't know if that part 103 that people realize that they have all the liability when they're flying it. Well, there's that. It's interesting that the manufacturer has no liability. The liability there, yes, lies in the pilot. But you know, we we at Aero Auto, you know, take safety, you know, to a whole nother level and, and really understand that this whole EV toll industry in and of itself has a, has a zero tolerance. Uh, opportunity for not just the FAA, but for the public itself, and and know that as soon as there's a crash or if there's a death, that the whole industry is done. And I mean, there's been two testing crashes that have happened in the last year uh, with a couple of companies that actually crashed their vehicles on purpose. The whole world went up and up in arms about you know these these flying cars that are crashing when it was just a a, a test that they were doing to see you know, testing the limits of the vehicles and, and it was, it should have crashed and they did. And, you know, but the media picks it up as, oh no, you know, these things aren't safe, but these things are going to be beyond safe. I mean, it was just a, it's a trivial thing, but you're right. All the headlines were crash. <laughs> yeah. The velocity, velocity thing wasn't a crash. And, and uh, the one from vertical um, that crashed last month, um, they, they turned off all the engines, all the motors to, to see, what would happen next? And hey, it hit the ground. Um, <laughs> but it fell from 20 feet and uh, nothing happened to the internal cabin, which right. was great to see. That, that was fantastic to, to hear that, you know, whoever was be a passenger in that would have been safe. Yeah, no one hurt. No, nope, no damage. But what's, what's beautiful about all the vehicles that, that we uh, explore is, is the, the safety redundancies that are, are being put forth. You know, whether it's multiple motors, multiple computers, uh, ballistic parachutes, uh, the ability to fly with, you know, less than the number of uh, propellers and motors that they have. Um, GPS is, is to a whole new level, LIDAR and radar to a whole new level. You know, I, I've been calling it to, the, to our customers, you know, you're flying in a bubble and, and you'll never have anybody inside of your bubble. And the, the, the sensors that are on these things will never let you crash into a building or a tree or another another air vehicle. So, you know, we're, we're real excited about what's out there. Do you track the, the autonomous car industry by any chance? Uh, a little bit. Uh, I'm just wondering if there's any parallel. What I've always viewed the electronic autonomous vehicles as a problem because you've got this legacy infrastructure of all these other cars, whereas in the air, there's no legacy infrastructure. It's just open open air that's 100 percent right you know you know there, there's no bikes and kids and trees and fire hydrants and rocks and boulders and ditches and um anything else that that you're going to run into with a car you know the the sensors are are going to essentially be quiet until you know you you, you say okay i want to land and then it starts picking up the things you know around you but you know inside the air like we talked about earlier you know 
you're you're talking a hundred years before there's there's enough vehicles in the sky to you know have any concern that you'd be running in anything by then you know all the all the sensors and data and and um being able to talk to each other are just going to be exponentially better you know at that point so what what excites you about all this oh man that's a that's a great question um a couple things the first uh, is that Aero Auto gets to to actually sell the one thing that everybody's always wanted. You know, there, there I haven't had anybody come by that that hasn't just been full of smiles and awe and wonder. And even the people who have actually put down deposits on the vehicle and they finally get to see it. They they bought it sight unseen or off of a picture, and they actually come by and they're like, "Oh my God, this is real! I didn't even think this was going to be real." So you know, it didn't matter like who they are in the community, whether they're, you know, the upper echelon or the lowest echelon, male, female, doesn't matter from what com- country they're from. Everybody's always wanted what we're, what we're selling. So that's the first thing. And the, the second thing is, is that we are at the forefront of this brand new ecosystem that is every day being dreamt up, created, invented, you know, that 150 years ago when it was just horse and buggy, and then the first horseless carriages came out, you know, there was no stoplights and parking lots and parking garages and gas stations and drive through restaurants and um, super highways. You know, all of this is, has come, you know, either through invention or, you know, need and, and um, the desire to do new things and, and create new opportunities, um, whether it's for because of traffic or because of use case. And you know, today here we are with this brand new opportunity of transportation that will one become a sustainable and an ecologically better opportunity than driving. Two, get us to where we got to go safer and, and quicker. And you know, I, I get to watch from ground level and to have all these amazing designers and engineers and mechanics and architects and stuff around me that are just dreaming up the newest, latest, the most amazing ecosystem that, you know, every day is going to be new. Where are you going to be able to find people to hire? <laughs> that hasn't been a problem. <laughs> no? Oh, man. I People are banging down the door. Really? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, everybody wants to be a part of this. Wow. Yeah. So when do you expect your first sale? Uh, we've had quite a few. Um, really? Oh, plenty. Um, when you say sale, though... Are, are right now we're primarily taking um, pre pre production deposits, um, but yeah, we've had quite a few. Um, in fact, uh, um, we've had about fifty in just the last couple of weeks. <laughs> wow! So when do you expect so, your first delivery to a consumer? That, that's up. To, that's up to the manufacturers. Yeah, I um, know. Sooner the sooner the better for us. Um, but the ultralights will be here soon. They're, they're being done and processed and, and delivered um, as we speak. But all the rest of them that aren't ultralights are, are still all, you know, square in the middle of their certification processes. Yeah, a lot of process. Sure, for sure. I don't, I don't envy the manufacturers at all for that piece of it, you know, and, and we, we go to them and say, look, you guys go do what you do best, which is design vehicles and let us take care of, take care of your customers and all the other problems that you have to do. That you don't want to deal with. I so much look forward to watching you succeed and progress as we go. So thank, thank you, you so, so much, much, Sean. And thank you all for listening to the voices of the Internet of Things.